Welcome to Life Laughter Divorce, episode 92. I am your host, Leanne Linsky. And I'm the boyfriend. Welcome back to another wonderful week of... Divorce. Look at that. We have got this down, like, finishing each other's sentences, the whole Whoa. thing. <laughs> We've become that couple. <laughs> On a divorce podcast, of all things. <laughs> Sad. Hey, so welcome back. We are glad to be here. And while you're settling in, tuning in, make sure you rate, review, and subscribe. Check out the website at lifelaughterdivorce.com. And hey, uh, if you're on the website for any given amount of time, you might notice that it, we may invite you to subscribe to our newsletter. You probably want to do that sooner rather than later because you may win a prize. That's right. There will be a drawing sometime in December, like a little door prize, if really? you will. Yeah, a little door prize. And, uh, you know, the other cool thing about the website is we have an online store and it just so happens to be shopping season for the holidays. So check that out while you're there. And why not prep yourself for the upcoming year and book your free life's coaching session with me and get a head start on making good positive change for the end of the year yeah yeah why not right yeah why not all right so last week we had a juicy episode with susan ball where she shared uh all about the details of like identifying a narcissist kind of outlining what kind of behaviors they to watch for and what they do and what happens in a relationship with a narcissist and when we ended, uh, it ended with her husband, uh, her running, literally her running from running her husband, from and her and husband. husband chasing her and threatening her in front of a police station. Right. Yeah. And he was arrested and put in jail. So this week we're going to find out what happens next. And we learned some other really, I think, important things. Uh, Susan really gives us a lot of information about uh, what happens next, not only in her personal uh, situation, but also in general, what happens next? What happens when you do get out of a narcissist relationship or a relationship with a narcissist? How do you heal from that? And, you know, I'm kind of curious, boyfriend, like we don't have kids, but if we were to have kids, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> None that we know of. Um, but if we were to have children, how, what would we, what would you want your kids to know? Like, would this have en ever entered your head to talk to your kids about this kind of No, because I'm, I'm, I've never dated a narcissist. I didn't even know there could be women narcissists, but we found that out. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, so I, and I'm, I don't identify as being a narcissist, so I don't know much about that behavior. So I wouldn't even know how to talk to my kids about it. Right. So I think that's what I think is, is so, what I really like that's different about this particular conversation is because, yeah, how, how do you, like this wouldn't talk. Why don't they teach us this in school? That's my big question. There's a the lot week. they don't teach you in school. Right? <laughs> like, why didn't anybody tell me? <laughs> so, so I think this, this is where we kind of even go beyond the narcissist relationship after what happens after and how not to repeat this pattern. So and how, he, and how she interacts with her kids and tries to help them learn about behaviors and make good choices in relationships. Yeah. That's, that's, I think is the most interesting thing that I found out about this episode because she does provide that information for her children, which is something we didn't we did, get. Yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, we never entered my mind. So in case you have not yet gone and listened to episode 91, I'd like to reintroduce our guest. Our guest is Susan Ball, founder of Empowered Her, author, speaker, and self-worth activist, and she's on a mission to free women from their abusive relationships. Susan's message is simple and begins once a woman escapes her abusive, toxic, or ugly relationship. She wants women to aim higher, to learn to recognize just how much they are worth, and for them to believe in themselves and establish healthy boundaries as they begin to dream again and love themselves unconditionally. Susan is a passionate, fierce cheerleader who encourages women to rekindle their joy and embrace their big, bold, blissful life. So without further ado, Susan Ball.
and I ran for the front door because the police station was about four blocks away. Mm -hmm. And when I opened the front door and I slammed it behind me, he caught on to what was going on. He chased me to the police station, threatening to kill me. Oh. Yeah, they arrested him at the police station. Oh, my God. Thank God, first of all, that you were within running distance. Yeah. Yeah, and that they caught him basically in the act of threatening you. Yeah, and then it gets, well, it gets better. His girlfriend bailed him out of jail the next day. I didn't oh know about the girlfriend. Oh, my God, <laughs> and you had only been married. Like, uh, oh, geez. So his yeah. girlfriend bailed him out. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, she was winning. Um, yeah. That's what I said. Winner. <laughs> right. Good luck. Um, what happened after that? Like, were you able to move out? And like, I can't even imagine. Well, you know what? I was broken hearted because yeah. and anybody who's out there listening, I was broken hearted and I was thinking that I wanted to fix this. Right. Because you're in that mental, uh, you're in that mentality. Right. I it, want to fix this. It's my fault. He's got a girlfriend. I must have done something wrong. Mm -hmm. And I remember calling my sister and my sister came to the to the house and she sat me down and she said, really? Really? so that he can either kill you or kill one of the girls or any of this kind of stuff. She says, it's time for you to leave the town, leave the house. I didn't want to leave my home, Leanne. This was my home, all of that stuff. But you know what moved me forward was my two little girls. I did not want them to think that this was a healthy relationship. And I say to women who I speak with all the time, if you have children, they're learning from you. Right. They're learning. They're either learning to be the victim or the abuser, one or the other. What did was that the first time that your girls had seen the abuse? Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So that that was the game changer for you. Now, if they hadn't seen that, do you think you would have stayed? I, I'm not. You know, that's a question I've asked myself over time, and I think I would have. Really. I think I would have because there was a big part of me that had, and this was something that uh, I know lots of women fight with uh, inside, and that's the guilt and shame. I had this horrible guilt and shame that I had to tell people that I had picked this person. Mm -hmm. And I had this horrible guilt and shame that I had invited all these people to this, this bogus wedding mm -hmm. and that I had scammed them somehow out of their money and their gifts. So I had all of this guilt and shame, and I felt very... Um, that I didn't have a way of explaining how this happened to me. Right. And is, and with that, did you feel like if you had told people about it, they would be like, well, how come you didn't know? Why didn't you leave sooner and bombard yes. you with quite? Yeah, because they think they're being helpful, but they're not. No. Right. Yeah. No. Because people, I, I, I completely hear what you're saying and, and people don't understand. Um, you know, a lot of it, we hear like, why don't they leave or why would you stay or something's wrong with them that they stay. But this stuff, it, it, they start with the emotional abuse first and get you in that place of that it's your fault and that you should be ashamed and that you're less than and you're this is what you deserve. Right. Yes. It's like it's a gradual thing. So uh, to, to people who haven't experienced this, it's easy because I before I had experienced anything with a narcissist um, and their emotional abuse, before that, I I probably would have been on the other side. Like, how could someone do that? Like, why would it? Why would you stay? Like, who in their right mind? Because guess what? Uh, life quickly teaches you lessons and humbles you when you find out firsthand that that's because it can happen to anyone and um and it's not a sign of a person being a woman being weak like it's not a weak woman it's just not a weak person who falls into an abusive relationship whether it's emotional or physical it can happen to anybody well his next girlfriend yeah well that's the question you always say to yourself oh i thought i was independent right. and confident and strong and how did this happen to me right but his next girlfriend we actually got talking mm -hmm. a little bit after everything blew up and she contacted me she was she was she said i'm so embarrassed and ashamed to tell you i'm a psychiatric nurse <gasps> see this is exactly what i'm talking about and see okay so when she told you that 
how I can only imagine how she felt having to tell somebody, right? Yeah. What and what, who is she going to go to to talk to her right, colleagues? Right, because they would say, "How of of you of all people didn't know?" Right. But I'll tell you something to be quite selfish about it. Yeah, that was one of my biggest healing moments. Really, it was like really because. Then, yeah. Little old me. <laughs> right. <laughs> could easily get, you know, caught up in something like this. <laughs> right. If it could happen to her, who's knowledgeable and educated on the topic, if it could happen to her, then I don't feel so bad it happened to That's me. That's right. I'm yeah. sort of like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that took a lot of baggage off your shoulders, I'm sure. But that is... You know, for anybody who's listening, yeah. that is a fact. I'm not lying about that. That's who she was. Yeah. So it can happen to anyone. And I have a client right now. She's a Harvard professor. So it can happen to anyone at any time. These men and women are very, very good at this. Yeah. And I think that's the uh, such a big message because so many people don't see that. They just see people who have been abuse as as weaker people and that is not the case they're it's not that they're not educated or they're not strong it's it can happen to anybody yep anybody because these people yep. have been doing this their whole life oh yeah they are masters of deception yeah masters I mean, of it and they're typically pathological liars so they're very good at it Right. Like, yeah, because when I look back on it, when he told a lie, yeah, nothing happened to his face, Leanne. <laughs> <laughs> when I tell a lie, people can generally tell that I might not be telling the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Right. Because your body language changes or you start to fidget or you, but nothing happens to them. Nothing. Right. Because in their mind, they're telling you the truth. They're true. <laughs> yeah. 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 So. Yeah. So fascinating. Yeah, these people are are masterful, very scary people, really. And, you know, so when we talk about narcissists, at the beginning, you had mentioned psychopath. And and some people now say sociopath, but not... When we say narcissism, we think one thing. And then we say psycho or sociopath, people think something different. But aren't they one in the same? They are one and the same. So sociopaths are people who have no empathy. Mm -hmm. So they socially, they don't know how to feel. They harm something and they don't feel any kind of empathy for them. And narcissists have that sociopathic quality. So, but they can pretend that they do. That's why they get you wrapped up in this because they will hurt you, whether it's verbally, emotionally, financially, any of those things physically, they will hurt you. They will go away. You're crying. You're devastated. Then they come back and they are the sweetest things that ever existed. Right. And they're not doing it because they're empathetic. They're doing it because it's part of the game. They let you move your piece one, one spot, one square. And then they pull you back two, and then they let you move one and they pull you back and they keep playing that game and they love it. They love it. Yeah. And people ask, you know, it's confusing because they don't have empathy, but people ask, but they do have feelings. Like they feel, they do have certain feelings, right? Not they like have, we do. <laughs> not like we do. They have feelings. They, their biggest motivation is control. What can they control and how are they going to make that happen? So they can, uh, what's the word? They can... <laughs> Um, bring about the illusion of feelings depending on what they're trying to control. Okay. So if they want to control your parents by getting your parents to think that they are a loving, caring husband, they will bring on compassion and empathy and interest and tears and all of that stuff. And it's all a mask. Mm. None of it's real. Yeah. But when you leave them, your parents are like, but he was so good. <laughs> yeah, he should have won an Oscar. That's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's how good he was, right? 
Yeah. Yeah. It, it's very, very scary. And they're not, they're very complex people because they're, we don't know which side we're seeing of them. So it, you can, it's not like you, there's no, unless you're in a relationship, is there any easy way to identify a person before you, you get sucked in? I think the easiest way is besides the love bombing, if they're talking about all their exes as if they are just the scum of the earth and, and it was all their fault and, and so on and so forth, big red flag. That's a narcissist. That's a narcissist speaking. If they start to say to you, you know, I really don't like your friend, Beth. I really think you shouldn't, you know, I don't want her coming around. Huge red flag because that's the beginning of isolation. If they start saying things like, well, I like that dress, but I would prefer you wear this one. That's not being kind to you or nice to you. That's manipulation. That's control. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So there's subtle little things, Leanne, that uh, if you see them happening or you go to go out with your friends and they say, this is a big one. You go to go out with your friends. You've been seeing them for you know a while. You're in the love bombing. You're always together. And then you say, you know what? It's my Pilates night. I I haven't been for a month, so I'm going to go. What they will do is they will sit there and they will start to get very upset. They might even cry tears and they will say, you know, I thought we were together in this. I thought that you loved me. I thought that you wanted to spend time with me. I don't understand. Which makes you question, what are you doing? Yeah. Do you really want to go to Pilates? Right. Right. Like, yep. Okay. And then you say, oh, well, this one time, one more a week won't hurt. Right. Right. Okay. So, yeah. So just be conscious of um, the little things, really, because they're going to seem like very little things. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's not like someone like he's doing something so outwardly crazy that Everybody would be like, red flag, red flag. These are little things that may seem like nice gestures or, oh, he just really likes me or, um, you know, he's being thoughtful or whatever. Or like, this is his pet peeve. No, they're a little things that really add up quickly. Correct. Okay. So what I say is if you have a life, if you're a single woman and you have a life, you go to the gym and you do all these things and you go to art gallery openings with your friends. Don't stop doing those things, no matter how much he cries. Because if he cries, he wants to manipulate you. Mm -hmm. He wants to take away your life. He wants to suck all the energy out of you. Keep living your life because you want a codependent relation or an interdependent relationship, not a codependent one. Right, right. So, so Susan, so now, because is it because of your own experience that you ended up becoming a coach for other people who are healing from narcissist abuse? Yes, because, and it wasn't because I decided to do that, Leanne. I actually met a coach who was a, a old family friend mm -hmm. and she helped me in my recovery. And it was mind blowing because I had been struggling as this victim of domestic violence for a long time. I was drinking too much and, and all sorts of bad behavior because I felt sorry for myself. I was very victim-y. Yeah. And she, I, I was very victim-y. I'll admit it. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. You know, after something like that, I, I can see, yep, that's yep. pretty severe. Yeah. But she helped me. Mm -hmm. And then I got, I got talking to her and she said to me, you're very, you're very good talking to people and very outward, outgoing and stuff like that. Maybe something you want to consider is becoming a coach. And I thought, what a, what a stupid idea. <laughs> I really did. But ultimately, I started to see that this was a way that I could reach out to women who were in this situation, because having lived it, one of the things I didn't like when I was going through counseling, and I'll be quite honest, and there's a lot of people, women out there that I talked to, I did not like when the therapist or counselor, when I would say to her, have you ever been in one of these relationships? Well, no, but I read it in a book. Uh, I don't want to talk to you. Right. Right, because they, they don't know. No. I mean, you can read all you want in a book. It doesn't it doesn't translate to having experienced it. Yeah. Well, when so so you how soon did you end up becoming a coach? So you at first you were like, No, I'm not gonna do that. Um It took me about five years altogether. Yeah. And then I didn't want to specialize in this particular niche. I thought, no, no, I don't want to talk about that all the time. That's terrible. 
-hmm. just want to help women, you know, live their best life. But the odd part was that only women who were in bad relationships were contacting me. So I said, okay. (laughs) (laughs) All right. It picked you. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So when, because women want to talk to another woman yeah, or even a man, men who contact me want Mm -hmm. to talk to someone who's experienced it because I can give them real life examples of something that happened to me. Right. Because this way they also know that they're not crazy. Yeah. Because that's how we feel when we come out of a a situation like that. We feel we've been gaslit for so long that we feel like, oh, obviously I'm crazy. Like I'm just, I don't, nothing makes any sense. No, exactly. So you question everything. Yeah. So when you, when you coach people, what, what is this process? Like how do, because this can linger for many years, like this change, this is life changing. You know, and and even if a a narcissist wasn't physically abusive, which you called a malignant, right? Is that the difference? Um, Even if there's emotional abuse like that, is it, do you find that's more confusing when there hasn't been any physical? Yes, because a lot of women come out of it. And the first thing they'll say to me is they'll tell a little bit of their story and then they'll go, but I don't think I was abused. Was I abused? Yeah. Yeah, because the common thing out there is, quote unquote, domestic violence. Right. And domestic violence means that you got beat up Mm -hmm. to women. They don't see it as um, being emotionally abused or financially abused or narcissistic abuse or any of those things. They don't qualify as domestic violence in their minds. Yeah. Yeah. They won't go to a shelter. And I've had women contact me. They're in a very bad situation, mentally, emotionally, their children, all of those things. And I'll say to them, contact the shelter right away. Oh, but he doesn't beat me. Mm-hmm. This all sounds Ooh, familiar. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh-huh. yeah. Yeah. Well, he hasn't done that. And their their key word is, well, yet, in a lot of cases. Like, he hasn't done yeah. that yet. And he probably will. Right. And they don't change. There's Mm -hmm. no fixing them. Yeah. Well, when they, so when people come to you, where do you start? We start by rebuilding her confidence. That's the very first thing that has to be rebuilt. And the way that I do that is I have every one of my clients and anybody who's listening, I highly recommend this. You start keeping a success journal because I want you to celebrate every success that you have, whether it's tiny, minute, medium-sized, jumbo, or the big one. Every time you do something and you celebrate it, you're building in your mind, oh, I already did that. Mm. Oh, my God, I can do the next thing because look at all the things I've already done. Yeah. Yeah. Celebrate them all. And we are conditioned to only celebrate big milestone events. You know, birthdays, weddings, uh, graduation, so on and so forth. I want women to celebrate everything. Have a dance party at the end of the day. Even if you only did one tiny thing, Mm -hmm. celebrate it. Yeah. Even if you only picked up the phone to the shelter to say, do you have any space? Celebrate that success because that's success. Right. And the big one is if you've left... The very first thing you put at the top of the page is today, I am no longer with my abuser. I am successful. Mm -hmm. Because that's a huge step. Yeah. And maintaining no contact. That's a bigger one. Yeah. Celebrate that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So no contact. All of those things. Celebrate everything. It's day five of no, no contact. Dance in your living room. That's a big deal. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Have a nice bubble bath and say, yeah, I did it. Did that. (laughs) Made it through the day. Didn't respond. Didn't respond. Yeah. Yeah. And and so once you start getting successes, you know, and rebuilding that confidence, what 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 comes next? Like, I feel like um, even though like confidence is rebuilt, that sometimes it's still like, do people go into isolation a bit? They do a little bit while they're first healing. They because we all have to go to the place where we're comfortable. Mm-hmm. 
But one of the things that I, I really, really uh, harp, harp on with my clients is what I call raw, rage and weep. Mm. Those three emotions need to come out. And a lot of times we're told by people, and I was, you know, kind of buck up. You're out of there now. When are you going to get a job? Time to move on. You've got two kids to look after, blah, blah, blah. But nobody said to me, damn straight you're angry. You know, be angry. Right. Be mad at him. I lost my home, my dream, my everything. Right. And cry. Cry those big, ugly tears for the same reason. The loss is huge. Because a lot of times we build it up and we build it up to this dream relationship yeah. because he's so good. He's so good. Mm-hmm. So you want that every day. You crave that every day. It's like a drug. Right. So if you can just get through the seven nasty days, that one day is worth it. Mm-hmm. But it's not. You know, that's a really good point is that's a big thing because you're not just grieving that relationship, but you're grieving because everything that had been fed to you was a lie. So it's not like, Oh, someone just left me like in a normal relationship where maybe there was infidelity or something, but that person not only just left me, they lied to me about my whole life. Like nothing I knew was true. Nothing that I thought was true. Everything turned out to be a lie. Like I had been living a a fake, fake life or a facade. Exactly. It is. And so you have to grieve that that lie. You have to grieve and forgive yourself for getting caught up in this. Yeah. And and forgiving yourself is a big step. Mm-hmm. So that I have my clients do that. Sit with that emotion. If you feel anger, if it's coming up and it's boiling up in you, it doesn't mean you punch something or do anything like that. You can even write it down or you can just sit there and say, swear inside your head. Mm -hmm. Do whatever it takes to really, really let that anger just have an escape. Because if you hold it in, you're going to get bitter and you're going to get ugly. Yeah. And and that's what's going to happen. The same with the crying. And then we move on to actually talking about what happened in an emotional sense. Because when you're healing, you have to get back in touch with your emotions, Leanne. All of them. The good ones, the bad ones, the sort of in-between ones all of them. You got to get to know them. So I started a process of writing, uh, writing about an event, writing about a memory. Mm -hmm. It it doesn't have to be grammatically correct. Just write about it. You can type it, write it, whatever flips your switch, write about it. But after you've done writing it, put it away, go back after a certain amount of time, read it and note down what emotions does it bring up? Does it make you feel angry? Does it make you feel stupid? Does it make you feel um, sad? What does it make you feel? And then after that, ask yourself, do you want more of that or less of that in your life? And how are you going to do that? Right. And that's where the changes start to happen. But suppressing any of those emotions, suppressing any of those memories is a bad idea. Yeah. Yeah. Because it'll bubble to the surface in the next relationship. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And that's how you start to see if you're compatible with somebody. That's where you get to the, this is what I want in a relationship. This is what I value. This is my boundaries. But you have to go through the emotional healing. Mm -hmm. And it's difficult. I mean, I had to go through it and it's not easy. And it'll bring up things that are like, ew, I don't want to, ew. (laughs) <laughs> I don't yeah. want to remember that. Like, yeah, right? So, I, so okay, so just listening to you, I could see where like those those exercises and going through that process would make such a huge difference for your future relationship. So when you think back to what you've learned, had you done those things after your first relationship with a narcissist before your first husband, would that how would that have changed things for you? It would have changed all sorts of things because I would have recognized in myself that I had, um, what's the word? I had, I had never in my whole entire life stood up for myself, raised my hand, used my voice and said, hey, that's unacceptable. 
Like if somebody tapped their watch now and said that to me, I would smile and say, oh, well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Right. And. <laughs> and. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And if they said, well, I'm not, you know, we're not going to have dinner together. I would say, okay, well, I'm taking myself. See yeah. Ya. Bye. Bye. Right. But yeah. when I was young and I didn't have boundaries and I didn't understand what I wanted or who I was. I that devastated me. Yeah. Right. If I had have taken the time, I would have discovered that I had some issues from my childhood that had never been resolved. And I was so desperate to be loved that I would put up with all kinds of things. Mm hmm. Yeah. Not now. So, so, yeah, big difference. Because and do you find that when people are coming to you for coaching, have they experienced like more than one narcissist relationship like you've had have people yes. is it a yeah it's a pattern it's a pattern and and when i say to them we're going to break the pattern and it's usually 99 percent of the time something that happened in childhood not because somebody maliciously did it to you leanne mm -hmm. not at all right it could be an event that you do, you've forgotten about and it's really? like oh my god there it is how do you now get how do you get to that? How do you figure like that's that's like a lot of inner work that you're doing at that point that they that that comes up, right? A lot of inner work, but when they do the writing that mm -hmm. I was talking about where they take a memory yeah. from the relationship and we're talking about that memory and how it made them feel, I will ask them, does it remind you of anything else that happened in your life? Which will make them go, oh, my God, I remember this time, you know, uh, my dad and I went to a kid's birthday party and blah, blah, blah. And then you have that moment of, and how did that make you feel? So you go back and forth between the two, and then the pattern emerges. Okay. And the moment emerges, and the 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 thing that you're carrying around with you that is sort of subconsciously energetically um like causing a, a problem mm -hmm. for you and and i don't mean that in a mean-spirited way right i certainly didn't look at myself and say oh my god um that was my issue i have to fix that no it wasn't about fixing it, it was about understanding it and understanding how it was affecting my life now right and it wasn't about accusing anyone or confronting anyone I ended up with a much more compassionate and loving relationship with my parents when I went back and I figured out what the problem was. Wow. I looked at them completely differently. I went, wow, I get it. Right. Right. Because things happen when we're kids and we don't know the whole picture. Like our memories are not, I mean, it's, some things happen so long ago, so we remember bits and pieces, right? And yeah, so it, so when we recognize those feelings and can identify the feelings with those sp specific memory, I can see. So I'm just like connecting the dots in my head as you're saying this. I'm like, this makes so much sense. So when so when you're coaching people and they've gone through this, like how how soon are people ready and really prepared to <laughs> hear your puppy? How so, how soon are people ready to go into a new relationship? You know, that varies. That varies. I always say to all of my clients to plan on one year plus one day before you even consider dating or yeah. even thinking about it at minimum. And why, why is it? What, what is it about a year? What do you think? A year? You go through all four seasons. You go through all of the patterns. You go through all of the memories of your lifetime. Mm -hmm. and you clear them over that time because every season every month every holiday triggers something mm -hmm. right. right yep so and narcissists love to ruin holidays oh if they can ruin christmas it's their best day ever oh really that's terrible <laughs> <laughs> Oh no. <laughs> yeah, no, they they just love to do that. They they uh, not with your parents. They would never do that. It would be a lovely Christmas. Right. 
But generally, you would go to his parents because he's going to manipulate it that way. And he is going to ruin that day for you and make you look like a complete and total wreck. Wow. That he has to put up with. I see. Right? Wow. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then you, the, his parents on it and so on and so on. So the year and a day is so that all of those things that you're going to go through with all the tools that, you know, uh, we develop in your uh, coaching sessions, you have a whole year to work through all the triggers because there will be things you forget. Yeah. And suddenly you'll be walking down the street, you know, uh, something, there's a, a display in a window or a car goes by and it's a certain type of car and this memory gets triggered. Yeah. And all these emotions come up. Now, if you're with somebody else, you have to explain to yourself, but you don't even really understand what's going on. Yeah. So you're more at the point you're suddenly crying or you're angry or you're feeling something. and You go, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And you're making excuses for your behavior. So if you give yourself the whole year, the whole cycle of a year, mm -hmm. you will have the opportunity to have all of those things happen organically. Right. I yes, I can completely see that. And, you know, so when people so let's say people go through this this year in a day and they go through the coaching and they get into a place that's OK. I would imagine like even to even though the, a lot of those things have been cleared, when they step into another relationship, do you find that people come back and, and want some more coaching? Because, you know, as long as we're aware of those things, we still have to develop new behaviors in a relationship. Yeah. And the big one always comes down to trust. Yeah. Trust. And the only way um, I had to learn this myself, the only way to learn trust again is to take that big, courageous step. Suck it up. Sit on the couch. Cry your eyes out while your new boyfriend is out with his friends. <laughs> <laughs> and bravely when he comes in, dab your eyes and say, did you have fun? Right. And as <laughs> you keep doing that, you start to recognize he's not doing any of those things. Right. Because and there's they, no other way. Yeah. And would it be safe to warn your new boyfriend or girlfriend that these things are not you're not projecting these things on them, but you're still triggered or. Yeah, still. Yeah, because they would have to understand why you're doing it. Like, you know, like, because cause a lot of people might think, don't project that on me. I'm not him. I'm not her. It, it's a funny thing. When I, I met my current husband and we have a very healthy relationship, I told him a certain part of my story because I felt that, that it was necessary. I think it's necessary to share your story. You don't have to go into gory details, but that you've had a hard time and you might have issues with trust or or these sorts of things. But I didn't tell him that I was strangled to, to blacking out because I thought right. that would hurt him yeah. to think that I got hurt that way. And I remember one day, this is a funny story, because <laughs> for many, for a longest time, I couldn't wear turtlenecks. And I live in cold Canada. So turtlenecks are pretty important. Yeah. <laughs> and we were going somewhere and I thought, well, I got to wear a turtleneck. It's really cold. out, And I put on this turtleneck. And I came out of the bedroom and suddenly I started screaming, get it off me, get it off me. And I was just ripping this shirt off. And he's like, after it was all over, he's like, what was that? And I was hysterical. Uh, yeah. And I had to tell him the rest of the story. Mm. And he said, I would have preferred to know instead of having this loopy <laughs> lady coming up. <laughs> Get it off me. Like, I thought there was a big spider. <laughs> so you can just picture that. So yeah. It, it's beneficial to tell, but don't make it the highlight of your relationship and don't make it the thing you're going to talk about on the first date or the second date or the third yeah, date. Yeah, right. Yeah. It doesn't need to be mentioned until there's some sort of relationship starting to develop. Mm hmm Right. Yeah. Because you want to get to know each other before you start telling all of these these horror stories. Yeah. You need some trust there. You need a a safe safe space to do it on both Correct. sides, right? Because um that's also not something easy for a new person to hear. That's right. That's yeah. Not that they're going to judge you, but I think that can I they would question can I handle this? Yes. 
Yeah. Wow. Because it is. You know, they they don't know what you're going through. They don't know uh, what's going to happen. And, and also, you don't want to be sounding like the girl on the date who's talking about her ex, that he's the bad one. Right. Because now you're doing the, he's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they're going, wait, I heard this podcast where she said if people are talking about... <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, you know, you want to... You want yeah. to leave it until there's a level of a relationship, whatever that looks like, right. before you start to say, you know, anything about it. And you don't have to tell the whole story. Yeah, right. Or, and it's all, but it's all too in how we present it to it. Because if we're like, I have to tell you something and it's very serious and, you know, like we have to talk, then you're presenting it as a, a bigger thing. But if you say, hey, is it okay if I share something with you so that if something comes up, you know where I'm coming from? Like, it's it's how we present it and how we wrap it up in a, in a package to a, a new person. Exactly. And that's exactly, I, I uh, presented it to my now husband was, there are some things that might come up in our relationship. <laughs> and they're a little... <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. But just, you know, I, I'm, I'm still struggling with some issues of trust and they come because of uh, this reason. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, despite the fact that I was strangled and, and raped and, and treated like garbage, the fact that he cheated on me really hurt. Yeah. That was the one that I really struggled with, Leanne. So with all of my clients and women I've talked to, there is one moment or one thing that they will pick out and that the one. Right. And it's not always the one that we would pick. That's right. Yeah. Because people will look at me and say, but he almost killed you. Yeah, but he cheated. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, I'm mad about that. There's, well, there's, there's a whole different sense of betrayal there. Now it's not yeah. just between the two of you. Yeah. And as, as absurd as that may sound to somebody else, that's, that's your, your trauma. That's right. Mm hmm. Yeah. And we all process those things so differently. So, yeah. So, so, wow. I'm just, I just, I'm like, there's so much to these complicated relationships with narcissists and, and God, I hope people out there that you haven't had to experience this or that you don't have to experience this and to educate. And my other question is, is, you know, we talked about having children with narcissists, but what, how do you... How do you talk to people who haven't had this experience and prep them? Like if your your daughters, how how do you talk to them about it so that it doesn't happen to them? When they were growing up, they we I talked about them to them honestly and openly about what happened, about healthy relationships, about um, men. Uh, we talked about everything. What happened to me after that with my girls, Leanne, was kind of a good thing. I became a very open mom, mm. talking about all sorts of things. And my girls really respected what I saw in one of their boyfriends. So if I saw something and, and the boyfriend laughed and I, I would sit down with them and I'd say, you know, what did you think about this when he said that or he did this? I thought it was crappy. Yeah. Good. Because it was. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I like the mom voice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I never told them. I never said, you can't see him again. Or did you see what he did to you? I always did it in a conversational way. Uh, you know, what yeah. do you think? Were you offended by that? Or was it just me? Am I, am I being overly sensitive? Yeah. So that they would start to see different patterns of behavior. And my youngest one, her first dating, first dating experience, she was like 16. And the fellow came to the house and uh, heard him come up the driveway and he honked his horn. Mm. Right. Yeah. And my daughter looked at me and I thought, I'm not going to say anything. Don't say anything. Don't say a word. <laughs> Let her do her own thing. And she opened up the door and she shouted, not going out with you, you jerk. If you can't walk to the front door, I'm not interested. And she slammed the door. 
And I'm like, yes, 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 yes. yes. (laughs) (laughs) You're like, oh, thank God. Oh, wow. What an awesome moment, right? Yeah. 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 And I like like how your your approach with them is conversational and not I like I don't in your example, you're not telling them, you're asking them, what did you think? What do you see? And let them because now they're aware of it. Yes, and they're looking at things and yeah. talking about it. Yeah. And and I can remember what as they grew older and and relationships became more intimate they would come to me and sometimes the questions were really hard for me to listen to Leanne yeah but I thought if I don't talk to them about this stuff who's going to talk to them about it right yep yep you know and sometimes I had to turn away and take several deep breaths and have a zen (laughs) moment yeah (laughs) or a drink (laughs) yeah (laughs) right but I knew that if they didn't understand how intimate relationships and sexual relationships work and what a healthy one is, they might find themselves in unhealthy situations like that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And and so really what we can do with kids is just have those conversations and keep the keep it open for more. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And if they come to you and, and you see something, if you see something, you, you see your daughter being treated poorly, in your opinion, please don't say to her, I don't like the way he treats you. That's mm-hmm. not good for you because you will push her farther towards him. Right. And he will pull out all the stops to make it work for him. Right. You need to sit down with her and talk to her about what you're seeing And is she comfortable with it? Right. And if she says, you know what, mom, I was thinking about it. I don't. Then you have an opening, but you still want to have a conversation, not dictate or say anything derogatory about this person. Because you'll lose. You'll you'll lose and he will win big time. Because as soon as she goes out to talk to him about that, he's going to say, I told you, I don't like your mom. She's interfering in our lives. And where are you now? isolation, manipulation. You are, yeah, you're mm-hmm. without your mom. Right. Do you ever coach parents? No. Hmm. God, I could think of a bunch that might need you. <laughs> <laughs> now that you mention it, I've been talking about it. I'm thinking, hmm, that's a very interesting thing. Right. Coaching, coaching parents of teenagers who are starting to date. How do you have those conversations? Because, you know, you think about um, that, that. How do people talk to their teens? I mean, you see it in movies or you know, <laughs> Lifetime movies all the time. That these are the, this is exactly what happens. This is the path they go down, and parents think that they're putting a foot down and they want to prevent it. Because if you had thought, if your parents had come to you and talked to you that way, you know, it probably wouldn't have helped you either. You know, no, it would have pushed me. When I was dating the fellow who was a narcissist, the guy with his watch, I can remember lots of time my mother saying to me, I don't like him. Mm -hmm. I just don't like him. Anytime he's around here, I just don't like him. Well, you know what that made me do? See him more. It wanted me to be with him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Isn't that something? And I started to ignore more and more of the red flags, Leanne, because it's like, oh, my mother doesn't like him, but I'm going to like him. Yeah. Right. (laughs) Hmm. Oh, kids, we think we know so much, <laughs> but even not when and we're it's, kids, it's even when we're adults, right? Oh. Even when we're adults, because I had friends tell me, what are you doing? And the more they treated me like I was being stupid or crazy, the more they pushed me away into being stupid. You know what I mean? Like they, the yep. more they put me into that spot. Um, yeah. You know what is a good friend question? If you have a, a girlfriend who and you see all the red flags in her boyfriend. Hmm. One of the best questions that I use this sometimes with my clients is to say, if someone was treating me like that, what would you say to me? Right. And mm-hmm. a lot of times people will go, uh, <laughs> um, because what would they say? Yeah, exactly. 
And that's kind of when they have that step back moment, like, mm. yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. true. So true. Yeah. Gosh, you're just full of so much information and it's such good stuff. And I know it's super helpful because when we talk about narcissism on the podcast, these get a high volume of listens. <laughs> um, so it's it's much more common than we'd like to like it to be. Um, if we were, if you were to leave our listeners with uh, one final word or juicy bit of advice or thoughts, uh, what would that be? When you see a red flag, whatever it may be, could be small, it could be big. When you see one, don't go into denial. Don't try to excuse it. Believe it. It's real. That's who he is. Yeah. Yeah. Trust your gut. Yeah. <laughs> Trust your gut. Well, this has been awesome, Susan. Oh, my gosh. Thank you so much for taking this time and a lot of time uh, uh, with us and really going through and being so thorough on, on everything. This has been so helpful. And I, I appreciate you sharing your, your own personal story because, wow, you you get it. You've been there. You truly know. And I can only imagine you're a tremendous help to to those you serve. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. I really do appreciate you giving me all of this time to talk about this because it is an important topic. It is so important. So thank you so much. I'm going to share all of your contact information in the show notes, which will be located on our uh, Life Laughter Divorce website. Also, show notes are the little blurb on iTunes that tells what this episode is about and anywhere else that you're catching the, this episode on. So thank you so very much. Thank you for having me, Leanne.